Welcome to the world of RNA. In 1960s, when Carl Woese, Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel proposed the RNA world hypothesis, suggestive of the fact that early life could have begun by using RNA as a genetic material, that concept or that, uh, uh, that hypothesis led to many people trying to unravel the different roles of RNA in cells. And from then to now, it is aston astounding to see how big the transcriptome of a cell or an organism is and also that it is resplendent with varieties of RNA with different functions. In this session, we are going to focus on one such small group of RNA, which is cis-acting small non-coding RNA, also referred to as cis-acting SNC RNA. So let us look at the learning outcomes of this session. RNA has a more significant and broader role than just in protein synthesis. They have been found to contribute towards regulation, structural support, etc. Depending on its function, RNA can be classified therefore into coding RNA and non-coding RNA, which further can be divided into various subtypes. Small known coding RNA comprise RNA sequences that are lesser than 200 base pair length. And these small non-coding RNA comprises one very specific group, which is the cis-regulatory RNA sequences. And these are generally present upstream of the start codon in the transcript. So let us look at one by one these, uh, these the, mainly the cis-regulatory RNA sequences. So the central dogma obviously suggested that DNA acts as a template to give rise to RNA through a process of what is called as transcription and RNA acts as a template to give rise to proteins through another molecular biology pro process called as a translation. And we all know that intermediate between the DNA and the proteins is a set of RNA that help in the formation of the protein. So the basic understanding always has been that the RNA has had to play a role majorly in synthesis of proteins. So mRNA, which is the coding uh, RNA, that means it has an open reading frame, which can be read by the ribosome to give rise to a protein tRNA and rRNA. So both rRNA and tRNA are required in the process of translation to give rise to the proteins. However, as you can very well note, rRNA and tRNA are not protein coding RNA. They are ones that are helping the protein coding RNA to synthesize the protein, but they themselves are not protein coding RNA. So they will fall under what is called as non-coding RNA. From that point on, as mentioned earlier, a lot of studies have been carried out and over a period of time, it has been observed that a transcriptome is much larger than the genome. So what is a transcriptome? Transcriptome is basically the set of RNA molecules that are present in an organism or in a system or in a cell. So a lot of high throughput sequencing technology. So once one could sequence DNA and RNA, uh, they, that increased basically the study of transcriptomics. And with that, what was observed is that there are many RNA which are not actually coding for proteins. In fact, what was very clearly understood is that 80% of the genome is getting expressed to form different transcripts, okay, but almost more than 60% of these transcripts do not code for a protein. So major or the majority of the transcripts that are formed 
are non-coding RNA rather than coding RNA. And therefore, from this, what has been understood is that if there are so many non-coding RNA getting transcribed within a cell, they would definitely be contributing to the functioning of the cell. And it also, therefore, gets you back to what uh, Carl Woes, Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel suggested that RNA definitely has a definitive role. So RNA has been observed to have a role in the development and evolution of higher organisms and that has been mainly by uh, them being more of having regulatory functions. So when you look at non-coding RNA, so non-coding, so as mentioned, about greater than 60% of the transcripts in an organism or in a cell are comprising the non-coding RNA. And these are further subdivided into small non-coding RNA, what is called as the SNC RNA. And the focus of this session is mainly going to be on small non-coding RNA and, of course, long non-coding RNA. So, the way by which you are defining these two groups is only by the length of the RNA sequence. So, small non-coding RNA are lesser than 200 base pair long, while the long non-coding RNA are greater than 200 base pair long. A lot of studies has been carried out with long non-coding RNA that are implicating its role in genome imprinting, dosage compensation, cell cycle regulation, pluripotency, retrotransposon silencing, meiotic entry, and telomere length. And with all of this, there also has been similar studies that have shown how small non-coding RNA also have similar functionalities within a cell. So the first group uh, or within the small non-coding RNA is present what is called as a cis-regulatory RNA sequences and these cis regulatory RNA sequences itself are of three main groups as of now. One is what is called as the IRES uh, regulatory sequence and that is internal ribosome entry site. You have what is called as a leader RNA. This gives rise to what is called as leader peptides and of course you have what is called as riboswitches. So all these three fall under this group of non-coding, small non-coding RNA. The next within the small non-coding RNA or the next group within the small non-coding RNA is those that influence the genes that give rise to proteins. So these uh, or these functional or structural, infrastructural small non-coding RNA comprise the tRNA. We all know that tRNA acts as an adapter between the mRNA and the new synthesized protein. So therefore, tRNA has an important role in translation per se. miRNA. miRNA has more of a regulatory role or a regulatory function. You have rRNA and we know that rRNA is a structural component of the ribosome. And it is not just a structural component, but it also gives rise to, or it is also responsible for uh, catalytic activity. However, when you put it under small non-coding RNA, the rRNA that is present in this group is 5S rRNA and 5.8 S rRNA, which are smaller than 200 base pair in length, and hence they have been clubbed under small non-coding RNA. And of course, you have several ribozymes which are lesser than 200 base pair in length and they act as enzymes. You have small nuclear RNA or snRNA. This is something that is very, uh, uh, when you, when you uh, talk of snRNA, generally you think of what is called as SNRPs. So SNRPs are nothing but small nuclear ribonucleoproteins and these are basically part of the spliceosome machinery that helps in the splicing of the mRNA. So this is highly involved in the RNA processing method. Then one has what is called as small nucleolar RNA. And this small nucleolar RNA is involved mainly in the ribosome myogenesis and, and specifically with relation to 
to folding and formation of proper ribosomal RNAs. So therefore, small nuclear RNA regulates the formation of the ribosome itself. Then the third group within the small non-coding RNA includes the introns itself. We all know that introns are present in the primary transcript and these introns are named so because it, the, the name comes from the word intervening sequences and it is it was understood initially that introns do not really code or do not really uh, contribute to the final protein that is being formed. So therefore, these introns are needed to be removed from the transcript to form the functional mRNA. But of course, now one knows that introns are have a much greater role than just being present as intervening sequences. So of the introns which fall within the small non-coding RNA are the group 2 introns and the group 1 introns and both group 2 and group 1 introns are self-splicing introns. So however these being all different groups of the small non-coding RNA, in this session we are going to focus mainly on the cis-regulatory small non-coding RNA. To look at the first, uh, uh, first cis-regulatory uh, small non-coding RNA, it is what is called as the internal ribosome entry site, that is the IRES RNA sequence. And, um, let us understand what is the role of IRES or what has been found out about the R IRES. Now, this is definitely associated, since the word ribosome comes in, it is definitely associated with translation. Now, we all know that in prokaryotes, okay, the shine delgarno sequence that is present in the 5' prime untranslated region of the transcript, just upstream of the start codon, is responsible for um, binding to specifically the sh to the 30S, that is a small subunit of the ribosome, and the interaction of the shine delgarno sequence is mainly with the 16S rRNA that is present in the 30S, and that is how the initiation of translation is given a uh, uh, given a start uh, because of the binding of the 30S to the mRNA per se. Now, when you Look at certain viruses like cricket paralysis virus, hepatitis C virus, or encephalomyocarditis virus. You will find that upstream of the star crodon in all of them is a very highly structured RNA sequence. You can therefore understand that all of this lies in the 5' prime untranslated region of the transcript itself, of the mRNA itself. But these highly developed or structured IRES, so they are what is called as IRES, are responsible for recruiting what is called as IRES transacting factors and these are actually initiation factors for translation. In fact, they are not, they are the non-canonical initiation factors, but they would eventually recruit the canonical um, initiation factors to recruit the uh, small subunit of the ribosome to be begin initiation. So, the understanding therefore is from all of this as seen in the virus transcripts, it is very clear that IRES has a role in translation. Which part of which phase of initiation? Mainly the initiation phase of, uh, phase of the translation per se. In eukaryotes, what is most prevalent way of translation initiation is by formation of what is called as a pre-initiation complex, which is also called as a 48S RRNA, uh, 48S in his pre-initiation complex. Now, this 48S pre-initiation complex comprises the um, initiation factor 4G, initiation factor 4A, and likewise, and all of these would bind to the 5 prime cap and having bound to the 5 prime cap from the 5 prime cap to the start codon it will start scanning the 5 prime UTR region until it reaches the AUG 
So the scanning is basically done to identify the start codon. And once it identifies the start codon, the 40S over there is now ready to take up and uh, is now ready to take up uh, the 60S and begin the translation initiation. So this is what is called as cap dependent translation initiation. However, what has been observed, although not very prevalent, but it has been found that in many cell, in many cells or in many transcripts, the uh, initiation does not begin with the 5 prime cap. So it is not cap dependent translation initiation. Instead, it has a specific RNA sequence that forms a specific structure. So here you can see that it is a hairpin loop structure followed by um, a sequence of A's and this itself can be recognized by the initiation factors which in turn can recruit the 40S. So in many it is just as simple as the hairpin loop but in many it is a highly structured uh, RNA that you can see over here. So this entire thing is the IRES. So that is recruiting the IRES transacting factors which in turn is going to recruit the non uh, the canonical initiation factors and those canonical initiation factors will recruit the 40S. And of the canonical initiation factors that the ITFs interact with it is majorly E initiation factor 4G and initiation factor 4E. So that is how you have the IRES, which is a small non-coding RNA, helping in initiation of translation even if there is no 5' prime cap. Then we go to the next cis-regulatory RNA and that is the leader RNA. Uh, this leader e RNA immediately strikes a chord uh, when you think of the tryptophan operon. We all know that tryptophan operon is regulated by repression. So one way of uh, um, repress, repressing the tryptophan operon is by the co-repressor repressor protein. But another way of repressing the tryptophan operon is by a specific RNA uh, folded structure or secondary structure called the attenuators. And so such attenuators that are found in the leader peptide region of the mRNA, okay, are considered to be the leader RNA. And since they are cis-acting, so they are part of the mRNA itself. So upstream of the structural genes is present the leader peptide. So that RNA when translated or when transcribed is going to give rise to the leader peptide right so that leader pep that leader rna is responsible for regulating whether the structural genes are going to be transcribed or not okay so that is something very very interesting so here as you can see this is an example of um another operon which uses such a cis regulatory leader sequence or leader RNA. So you can see over here how you have specific sequences of RNA which are complementary to each other and therefore they will form a very defined secondary structure. So the AP loop, the CD loop and the EF loop, okay, they are what is forming attenuators and this EF which forms the final helping loop structure is followed by a sequence of U's. And that is an indication of termination. So therefore, this is actually acting as an intrinsic terminator. So if you have the E and F uh, hydrogen bonded with each other to form a secondary structure, then you would definitely have no structural genes getting transcribed further or translated further rather. So let's say for example over here, you have uh, the ribosome and you must understand that generally the leader RNA has a greater role uh, in bacteria where you have the transcription and the translation uh, going on hand in hand. So you can see that the ribosome is synthesizing the leader peptide, okay, but it cannot move further 
on because there is an attenuator present or rather the presence of histidine is defining how fast the ribosome is going to move and depending on how fast the ribosome is going to move, uh, the RNA polymerase has already moved forward transcribing these. So, because there is complementarity, you have these structures being formed and if CT and EF are formed, it is bound to be an intrinsic terminator and therefore, you will have transcription also stop because beyond this point, you will not have the RNA pol uh, synthesizing further because of the presence of the poly U. So, here what you therefore understand is the structural genes are not going to be synthesized. But say for example, you have sufficient histidine and the uh, ribosome and the RNA pol. So, the ribosome doesn't halt. So, it goes on almost together with the um, uh, RNA polymerase. So, as RNA polymerase is still to uh, transcribe the F part of the attenuator, you, you have... Uh, because the, this ribosome is following suit, you have the formation of BC and DE and BC and DE are not equivalent to the intrinsic terminator. So, there, there over here is now no attenuation. So, when you have secondary structures of BC and DE formed, you will have no transcription in inhibition or no transcription repression and the structural genes are going to get transcribed. So, whether an attenuator with an intrinsic terminator is formed or whether an attenuator without the intrinsic terminator is formed decides whether the structural genes are going to be transcribed or they are not going to be transcribed. So, that is the functionality of the leader RNA sequence and because they are generally short sequences less than 200 base pair, they fall under the small non-coding RNA. Now, of the cis regulatory group, let us look at the riboswitch. It is very interesting why the name riboswitch has been given because it is this RNA sequence that decides whether the gene expression is switched off or switched on, and that's why the name riboswitch. So, another interesting facet is that the riboswitch is generally part of the 5' prime untranslated region of the, uh, of the mRNA just upstream of the start codon. Of course, what has been found is that some cells or some transcripts can also have the riboswitch present on the 3' prime untranslated region or 3' prime UTR, but majorly it is present in the 5' prime UTR. Now, as you can see over here, uh, this is the 5' prime UTR part of an RNA and the 5' prime UTR part because of complementarity present within they have specific folded RNA uh, formed and these folded RNA in fact are defined into two specific domains. One domain is what is called as an aptamer domain and the second domain is what is called as the expression platform domain. Now, it is the aptamer domain that can bind to a specific ligand. So, you can very clearly understand that the structure that the RNA adopts because of the sequence or the nucleotide sequence, that structure that is formed is very specific for a particular ligand. So, you cannot have any ligand coming and binding over here, but a very specific ligand can recognize this confirmation of the RNA and come and bind to it. So, in the absence of the ligand per se, you can see that there is no ligand and so there is no, no ligand attached to this riboswitch. So, in such a, such a condition where there is no ligand, the switching sequencing is such that you have now a anti-termination loop being formed and because there is an anti-termination loop being formed, you will find that the transcription will move ahead. But at the same time, suppose the ligand is there, then the ligand will bind to the aptamer domain. On binding of the ligand to the aptamer domain, the conformation change is such that the switching sequence makes it a form which lets it become what is called as the intrinsic terminator. Since you have the terminator being formed, it terminates expression. So, what is very clear therefore is that 
This riboswitches are present mostly in the fibronuclear region and that the switching sequence can toggle between the two domains, that is between the aptamer domain and the expression platform domain. So you can also see how a change in the structure in one of the domain is going to affect the change or is going to lead to a change in the structure in the second domain. And because of that, there is a switch on and a switch off mechanism. So here you can see there is anti-termination signal and therefore expression will continue while here it becomes a termination signal and therefore expression will halt. So there are variety of ligands that can be recognized by a variety of aptamers and because one has now understood the structure, structural aspects of aptamers, many aptamers are synthetically uh, made in uh, vitro to be used for specific purposes because you can see how aptamers have a very uh, a specific binding affinity to a specific ligand and so it can be used for studies where you want a certain ligand to come and bind to these RNA constructs. So there is a lot of structural diversity of these uh, ligands, uh, sorry, of these uh, aptamers. And the structural diversity is because of the typical secondary and tertiary structures that the RNA takes up. And that is all through folding. And the folding depends, of course, on various factors, the surrounding environment of these RNA, and also the presence of several metal ions, etc. So there are several families of riboswitches that are present, and that is based on ligand binding of the aptamer 2 the ligand or it is based on the secondary structure that has been adopted by the RNA molecule itself. So this is the third uh, uh, a third uh, example or a third um, RNA, um, small non-coding RNA which is part of the cis regulatory small non-coding RNA group. So let us make the conclusions. Small non-coding RNA are less than 200 base pairs in length and that in turn are involved in regulatory as well as infrastructure roles. The small non-coding RNA are further subdivided into three groups based on their structural functional aspects. Their higher order structure contributes to their unique functions. The cis-acting IRES enables cap independent translation initiation while the leader RNA and the riboswitch are responsible for regulating translation. The understanding of the structural aspects of these small, no, small non-coding RNA has enabled designing synthetic small RNA for therapeutics and other applications. So advanced sequencing techniques and transcriptomics have led to identifying several small non-coding RNA that carry out specific functions in cells. With cis acting small non-coding RNA having majorly a regulatory function. Thank you.